You're listening to Welcome to Eloma, a podcast for highly ambitious dreamers who get shit done. I'm your host, Kylie Peters. This is a space where we talk about capturing an audience in a virtual environment. So we're all on Zoom or Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or you name whatever virtual platform you've been living on for the last couple of years. Um, And the truth is that while things are changing somewhat, this platform is not going away anytime soon. And for many people, uh, it's becoming a more integrated part of the world that they live in, especially for anybody who's looking to book speaking engagements. Of course, we still have like in-person events, but uh, virtual speaking opportunities are becoming really, really prevalent. And those kinds of speaking engagements present their own uh, challenges versus just an in-person opportunity. So we're going to dive really far into this topic today with today's guest, Christy Siefken. She is going to share a few ways on how we can leverage our virtual environment to captivate our audience, even though we're not there in person. Christy has nearly 20 years of experience as a local and national TV broadcaster, a national spokesperson, a corporate trainer, and an event speaker. She teaches professionals all over the place to amplify their voices and grow their careers. She teaches individuals and teams to craft clear and powerful messages and she and to deliver them with purpose and passion, even through a webcam. All right. Welcome to Eloma, Christy. Kylie, thank you. You were hired to do my PR. That was a beautiful thing. <laughs> thank you for that. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's it's lovely to have you on the show. Um, and you are obviously a veteran in this space. So Talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the speaking landscape change over the last few years and how you think it's going to look over the coming years. Well, you brought up an awesome point about the landscape of just speaking professionally changing. But even if you don't do that as a career, you now are expected to be in the space and be good at it. And think even in January of 2020, when our, when our lives were quite different, many people didn't have to speak at all. If you weren't in a prime yeah. leadership position, or if you did speak, you did all of your presentations in person, even if it wasn't on a stage, it was in a boardroom, it was a one-on-one meeting. Now mm-hmm. the expectation, thanks to the pandemic, thanks to living in Zoom and WebEx, and honestly, thanks to digital marketing becoming the primary way that a lot of organizations are marketing themselves, the expectation is that we know how to do this well. And it really is yeah. an unfair expectation for all of us, because the skills that it takes to be comfortable through this, talk to anybody who's been in television, who's been in movies, uh, who's in the video podcasting space, it takes specific tools and practice and accountability to really become comfortable. So what what I've seen with a lot of my clients are people who have risen through the ranks in their job. They were able to give the occasional speech in person. And now the expectation, whether they work in a company or they're an entrepreneur, is I need to be a brand, Christy. People want to see me. I can't hide behind just a memo or even thought leadership with the written word. People want to see me in this space. And for many people for whom communications is not a natural skill, they panic and they feel like something's wrong with them when they frankly have just never been taught the skill set. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you bring up a, a really good point there. Like, we are now expected to be experts at a thing that is literally a full-blown profession right. for a group of people. Right. <laughs> so for anybody who didn't think their full-time job was like enough, like take on this part-time role of becoming like very good on camera and yeah. judgment-free, right? <laughs> and the and the worst critics are, of course, ourselves. The fear yeah. people come in with is, how am I going to be judged? Am I going to look like a fool? But real often, it's not even the audience that's criticizing you. You're criticizing yourself because the way yeah. that we see ourselves on video and hear ourselves is completely unnatural. It, just if you look at it from a, a technical perspective, we look at a image of ourselves that is not mirrored when we play the video back. So it's not how we usually see ourselves when we look in a mirror. The way that that's we hear ourselves when I'm speaking to you right now is different than when I listen to myself on a video because I'm not just hearing uh, the sound traveling through the air through my ear, but I'm hearing also the um, 
uh, internally the reverberation within my ear. So that's why you sound different to yourself than when you listen to yourself on a video. So it's no no surprise that we see a vi- yeah a video recording of ourselves and think, who is that? That's not me. I don't look like that. I don't sound like that. Oh my gosh, I, can't. I sound like that. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. And I, I thank you for bringing it up because um, I, uh, in high school, I was involved in like our media studies program. And this is back when like we were still using VHS tapes. So oh, like, yeah. real cool. At least it wasn't beta. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but I remember hearing my voice on like a voiceover mm-hmm. and I, I went to my teacher and I was like, this is what I sound like. I sound <laughs> like a mouse. And he's like, you have a great voiceover voice. And I was like, are you deaf? Like, yeah. I sound like yeah. a mouse. This sounds crazy. It's just so interesting. And so I, I love that you bring up like we are our own harshest critics because yes. I mean, we are. Yes. Um, okay. So, so we've acknowledged like this is a, a part-time, if not a full-time job now for everybody, whether they liked it or not, yep. uh, but it's not going anywhere. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of adapting to this virtual medium. You can avoid it, you can ignore it, you can run, but you can't hide, is what I say <laughs> to so many people that have been putting this off, putting this off. I Individuals in particular will come to me, I hear, get a common line in an email or a common line on the phone of, I have been afraid to do this because I don't think that I can. Or I've tried it a couple times. I shot a, a few reels for Instagram or TikTok, or I did a few virtual presentations. And Christy, it was a disaster. And people feel like all their expertise, all the value they bring to the table is gone because they can't communicate it in a way where they feel comfortable and confident. So it really is a, is a big hurdle for people. And as people look at the future and having to embrace this, it is not just for your success in the professional space, but I have a feeling that at a certain point, every dating app is going to have video components to oh, it. Geez. Every interview that you do to maybe stay in somebody's Airbnb or to make a new uh, you know, audition wow. or try out for a new board, it's going to require this video component. And so much of how we learn to trust somebody when we can't be in person is communicated yeah. through our face and our gestures. And I don't know if this has happened to you, Kylie, but we become weird when we get in front of a camera. (laughs) We become a version of ourselves that is not always weird. (laughs) But I love that. (laughs) It's a different, a whole different version of weird. A whole other set of weird. Yeah. Yeah. In normal life, you might never be the person that's swaying side to side in a chair. You might never be the person who is saying, you know, and like, and you know, and like, you have all these odd behaviors. You watch yourself do them. And you become so dissuaded that you just give up. So I just want to tell people as as you start to look ahead at having this incorporated in your life, don't give up. The first time you rode a bike, it was weird. Your hands were going like this. You fell (laughs) off the side of it. The first time that you probably baked some sort of, you know, gourmet meal, uh, it, it fell flat and had too much salt and was burned, right? We all have to start at a place where you're making the mistakes. And, and that's true for being on camera as well. It's it's the journey that every new reporter goes through. And now uh-huh. whether you're a business person or you work for someone else, you've got to kind of get those bumps and bruises too. And you want to get the experience doing that offline when it's not the official presentation, when it's not the yeah. official speech and make sure that you're getting those reps in to be become aware of where you need to grow. I like what you say there about get those reps in. Um, Talk to me a little bit about that, like the importance. And I'm going through a speaking program right now myself, and they talk a lot about repetition. So talk to me a little bit about the importance of reps and practice and rehearsal when it comes to, you know, this medium. Absolutely. If you don't practice and you don't watch yourself, you will not become better. I use the analogy of professional athletes and anybody who's played a sport or even a high school sport, I use fina- uh, football as the analogy. You go back, you have a game. After the game, you sit down with the coach, you watch the tape, you watch the recording. This is also done, of course, with people who are professional figure skaters, people who are swimmers. It's sitting down and looking in a nuanced way at uh, the movement of the body, the breath, all of that. Those are components of speaking as well. And so you have to look at this as a performance in the same way that you would Mm -hmm. an athlete. That doesn't mean you want to be performative. 
you don't want to memorize and you don't want to be mechanical, sure. but you want to look at specifically what you need to tweak and then apply those tweaks the next round in. And the best way to do that so you become a natural communicator is to incorporate practice in your daily life. That doesn't mean, yes, it's great to get on social media, start making videos, but I'm talking even simpler than that. When you've got a pile of laundry this Sunday, you set up your cell phone. While you're folding laundry, talk into that green dot or talk into that camera lens as if it were a friend. So you're doing something you have to do anyway, and you're not in your head because you're being distracted by folding the laundry or boxing your meals or whatever the task is. Yeah. And it could be talking about any topic. I always recommend start with something that comes naturally. Start with something you're passionate about. So don't practice your on-camera business presentation skills by giving a business presentation. Practice them by talking into that camera about the new hobby you picked up. Maybe it's clothing design. I, I grew up sewing and designing clothes. So that's a passion of mine I'm starting mm -hmm. to dip back into. And I might talk into that camera about the fundamentals of learning how to use a sewing machine or the fundamentals of how to choose different fabrics or where I get inspiration for my clothing designs. It can be kind of nonsensical, but the idea is when you speak about something you know well and you are really passionate about it, that's when the most authentic version of yourself comes through. So you get the reps in by talking about not something business related, not worrying about, oh, this has to be a perfect marketing piece for my website. The more you do that, that version of you will start to show up in the professional presentations. I love that tip. I love that tip because, I mean, I'm sure people listening are thinking like, okay, well, it already takes me long enough to do my presentation. I have to practice like the content that I'm saying. Now you're telling me I have to practice more and more. Yeah. I love that. That's that's so applicable and something you can integrate into your everyday life. I love that. Absolutely. It's time um, you're already spending doing something. So might as well get a two for one while you're at it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, again, that's really interesting. Um, and I love your, your point too on, um, I know I've, I've found this for myself and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, when I am confident in the thing that I'm talking about, I'm like, yeah, I can, I can talk about this. Got it's this. like that, that'll be fine. It's always the things where I'm like, I think this is the thing that I should be saying <laughs> where I'm like, blah, 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 and just like a, a hot mess. Um, so yeah. So, so practice on the things that you know and are passionate about yes. and also like know what you're talking about in real life, like when it comes, but, um, know your content. yeah, no, no, yeah. Know your content. Um, so on that, on that note, um, so practice important, know your yes. content important. Let's talk about some of the other low hanging fruit things that people need to really focus on when they are properly going to deliver content and captivate audiences in a virtual environment. Absolutely. Setup is part of it. Should we talk setup for a little bit? Yes, please. Because yes, please. I, I have, should have a permanent bruise on my forehead from banging my head against the desk to see some of these setups that exist three years in. <laughs> in Zoom. Um, you'd think that looking up somebody's nose for three years, one of their coworkers <laughs> would tell them, we can see your nose hairs. You need to trim them and you need to adjust your camera. Oh, no. But for some reason, nobody's telling people this or the, we're still getting the witness protection program lighting where somebody's got, they're sitting behind a window and there's no light in oh, front of them. Yep. And it, yeah, it looks bad and, or, or poor sound, poor audio quality. Um, I'll mm -hmm. share a little inside tip with you here on the audio front. Yeah. One of my clients manufactures a leading wireless Bluetooth ear piece, earbud, mm -hmm. and it is extremely popular. I can't name it, but everybody loves it. Mm -hmm. And in a training with this group on presentation skills, I had to break it to them that their device that they've their companies made billions of dollars selling gives extremely poor audio quality and that they actually had to remove their parent Ouch. company's um, earbuds in order to get better sound quality. So while we mm. our knee jerk is to use whatever tools we have, which is great. I'm all about doing a lot on with what you have and on a low budget. Okay. You need to test these things. So let's walk through. We'll start with audio in terms of your setup. Often yeah. Bluetooth earbuds are not the best choice. Couple of reasons. The quality may not be good for this unnamed client. 
And you may, your batteries may unexpectedly die. The worst thing you can do is be in a podcast or giving a presentation and the Bluetooth connection drops out, your batteries die, even though you charged it, just don't risk it. Some people use the old school plug in the side of your computer earbuds. I really don't mind that. Generally, the audio quality is pretty decent. Visually, it might not look that great. So what I Mm -hmm. recommend is what you and I have done, which is invest in a microphone. And yet again, it doesn't have to be expensive. Word of warning about podcast microphones, because there's (laughs) there's several brands, yet again, not to bash any particular brands. Yeah, I'm curious as to where this is going. (laughs) People are excited to think, oh, I'm going to get a podcast microphone. This is going to be the best audio quality. Many podcast microphones are omnidirectional. So it means that they pick up audio from all sides of the microphone. Mm -hmm. They were designed that way originally because back in the day when we did podcasts in person, somebody would sit on one side of the table, somebody would sit on the other. So you want a microphone that picks up sound on both sides. Here's the problem. People buy these microphones not realizing that unless they have a really soundproof room, the side of the microphone away from me is going to pick up the dog walking through, the sound of the fan on the other side your partner slamming the cabinets in the kitchen. So those microphones, while it might, they might seem shiny and fancy, aren't always the best choice. You're better off to get what's called a cardioid microphone. It has a, a heart-shaped receiver. It's cardio like a heart. And that will only really pick up sound or only picks up sound on one side. The other side is blocked. So if you want really clear, crisp audio, go on to Amazon or your store of choice, get a cardioid microphone and keep it as close to your mouth as possible. You're, you have a great setup there with your mic. Mine is a little bit lower in my lap. You can get one of those boom arms, but yeah. don't be tempted by the flashy. Everybody has this podcast mic because sometimes it's not the best audio. No, I love that because and I'm not in the business of brand shaming either, but <laughs> I've heard of, you know, there's, a, I'm sure we can all, make assumptions. We've all heard of like these fancy microphones and like, I'm not going to lie. I was tempted by them too. Um, and I, I heard from a lot of friends who use them. They're like, don't buy XYZ brand because it sucks. Yeah. Like, well, that's surprising. Um, but I, I didn't know this thing about cardio microphone microphones. So yeah. I might, I mean, I like my microphone, but Your microphone. I know that it does pick things some up, up sometimes. Yes. So, okay. Yes. This is, this is the, the, newscaster, you can take her out of the studio, but can't take the studio out of her. So I share this <laughs> and, and it can be pretty affordable. You can get a, a mic for under a hundred bucks that, yeah, whether, or even cheaper if you go, if you go online. So having good audio, audio is king. I'm a big proponent of that because if my, if my video cuts in and out, yeah, it's not great. It's not professional, but if you can't hear me, my message is lost entirely. So yeah, audio is first. True audio first. And then in terms of your lighting setup, well, I have a couple of box lights here because I I do this frequently enough that I made the investment. Mm -hmm. I am all about heading to Goodwill. I tell people get a couple of lamps that you see in a living room, get two of them, screw off the drum, screw off the lampshade, put one at about two o'clock on your desk, one at about 10 o'clock, And instead of having the lampshades on, you're going to drape just a piece of sheer fabric. It could be a pillowcase. It could be a handkerchief. And you're also, if you can, going to add a third light in the middle. Sometimes you don't even need that. What you're doing is setting up classic three-point lighting, which is what's used in in many Uh movies. It's used in TV shows. The point of putting the fabric over it is it softens the light so that it's a softer Mm -hmm. glow. So people go and invest in these $500 $500 light kits. I've had some clients that yeah. come to me and say, Christy, are these the light right, right lights? And I say, yeah, they're great, but you could have done it for you know $8.95 with the technique that I just shared. So making sure that you've wow. well lit to see, our, to see your expressions and to see your gestures. And yeah. there's all sorts of research behind the, the necessity for that to really internalize a message. So to the to our earlier conversation about virtual, you've got to adapt. There's lots of distractions. If your audience can't hear you, if they can't see you, this sounds so fundamental. Um, All of those distractions, my notifications popping up, my dog running by, the flash sale on Nordstrom, all of that's going to distract me on my computer screen and I'm not going to pay attention to you. So you want to make sure those two 
things are are really nailed. And then mm-hmm. obviously keeping things simple in your background. If you have some really awesome collection of books or some really cool tchotchkes, that's great, but make sure that they're not so distracting. People are spending time looking at that instead of looking at you. Yeah, no, that's a good call. I've definitely been on those calls mm-hmm. where there's like so much in the background. You're like, oh, do I have any of those books? Yeah. I think <laughs> I read, I think I read that in high school. I think I read the Cliffs Notes version of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, okay, so you gave us great tips on the microphone, great tips on the lighting. Um, anything else in terms of like equipment that somebody might need in order to do this and do this well? Yes. One thing I will say I forgot to mention with the lighting is also your framing. I just want to add a couple notes there. What you have set up and what I have set up, we are poster children, if I may say so, Kylie, for how you want to frame yourself. And it's using the rule of thirds. Are you familiar with rule of thirds? Yes. Yes. And so for those at home who haven't heard of it, traditional setup within photography, videography, uh, that you compose your frame so that it's in thirds. And in this case, an easy trick is just to look at your eyes. The level of your eyes are about a third of the way down within the frame. And with that said too, whether you're using the camera in your laptop, whether you're using an external webcam, make play with it enough so that it actually is that eye level. And please, please, mm-hmm. please look in the camera because the way to be really not engaging and to get your audience to tune out is to have my gallery over here. And then the whole podcast, I'm talking to Kylie over here. <laughs> um, we, we from infancy look to the human face and specifically the eyes. These are this yeah. it, gestures that we can't even sense. We look to that for social cues from being a baby. And it continues into adulthood. So there is something to be said for those who who do have their vision to be able to pick up on those cues and really make that deep connection. It's why when you see TV newscasters telling a story, they're telling it into the camera. They're not looking over here because that's the way you're making the human connection. In terms of other equipment, if you're in a room that doesn't have carpeting, throw down some carpet. You don't have carpet, Yet again, when you're at Goodwill, pick up some old towels or carpeting squares or something to help mm-hmm. with the, the sound reverberation. If you get into the whole space of doing videography, doing audio, I could do a whole separate podcast for you about that. But there <laughs> are some great tools, yet again, many of which are affordable. I just, I really encourage people to use what you have or use resources that are affordable. There's There are many high-end expensive products and apps and software that you can use, a lot of that you don't need. If you if you really, really want to have a teleprompter software, I would say wow. resist it. <laughs> okay. I'm I was like, say, that, that, seems, that seems intense, man. <laughs> if for people that are content creators, a lot of people love it because yeah. that way they well, don't have sure. to worry about re-recording, re-recording. But Uh, The number one way to sound and look unnatural in giving a virtual presentation is to read off a script or to use one of these. It's hard to use a teleprompter app well. There's a reason it takes people who are professional broadcasters years to sound and look natural doing it. Because most of us, when you're reading on the teleprompter, it's going to be really obvious that my eyes are going side (laughs) to side. When you start out, your head is going side to side. So learn your content, know your content and your key messages inside and out and put the script away. If it helps you write the script to get the thoughts out, great, but steer away from that when you're in the virtual space. For sure. I love that. When I, uh, I, back in the day, I took a couple of acting classes and they were teaching us how to use cue cards. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is hard. Yes. <laughs> this is hard to make it look anywhere near natural. So yeah, it, it's a, totally a skill. It's totally a skill. Um, so Christy, let me ask you this. You've done this a million times, right? This is this is your jam. But yeah. I'm sure there's a couple of humdingers where you were like, <laughs> wow, I don't want anyone to know that I did that thing on camera or like I messed up this bad. So yes. I'm going to ask you, could you share one of your most embarrassing on camera moments with us? Because, and yes. I'll give it a learning opportunity. So okay. most embarrassing moment. And what did you learn from it? What if it was embarrassing and I learned nothing? <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. You can say that. I mean, I'm no. into it. <laughs> I'll give you one that was a learning opportunity. And and I don't, I, I share the story frequently because I want people to know 
you have to come from a place of yet again, falling off the bike a lot before you get yeah. to the polished place. <laughs> Well, my first career before I was in broadcasting and before I became an entrepreneur was in the nonprofit space. And I was an internal business consultant at the company. So I did data analysis. I did business plans. I did spreadsheets. I was good at it. But what I really loved was communications. I knew that that's where I wanted to go. And a mentor came to me and said, you're hiding your light under a basket. You really need to be doing this. We have an opportunity for you to be a spokesperson, talk to the media at an upcoming community event. Okay. So nothing huge, but it was going to be an interview and uh, on camera. Very exciting. No broadcasting background, no experience at this point. And I was like, this is my chance to nail this, to prove that I'm good at this. And maybe the company will let me do it more. I did what many uh, type A perfectionistic, high achieving people do. And I prepared for the media interview like I was going to be writing a dissertation or taking a test. So I got all these facts and all these statistics and (laughs) memorized all this really in-depth information. And of course, I get to the event that day and this local news reporter doesn't ask anything about any of that. She was asking me, as she should have been, high-level questions to to tell a a high-picture story. And I couldn't answer a single thing because I was so in the weeds with my statistics and data and case studies Not to mention that I was a deer in the headlights, couldn't remember a single thing. My interview was so bad as the subject matter expert. She went and did what's called a man on the street interview. So man on the street interview is, you'll see it typically on a lighter story. So let's say there's a huge storm in town and you see the local reporter interviewing the mom and her kid in the Target parking lot. Like, what do you guys think of the snowstorm? What are you going to be doing? Man on the street is you talk to a random stranger. I was so bad on camera. (laughs) My messaging was so bad. I was so nervous. She interviewed random strangers about my subject matter expertise. And that's (laughs) most of what ended up in the news story. I think there was a portion of me saying one sentence and I I was mortified. And I thought, I'm never going to get asked to do this again. Thankfully, the company did not hold it against me. They knew it was my first time. But yeah. my my learning here was twofold. It was the skills, the communication skills that make us successful in writing and in business and in college do not translate to being a successful spoken communicator. That was lesson number one. Yeah. So number two was that for the media particularly, you cannot speak the way that you speak even in giving a short speech or in a boardroom, that's a whole craft in and of itself. And once I became a broadcaster, and then once I started doing media trainings and messaging trainings, my focus really became on helping people talk in those good sound bites and making sure that stories Mm. are, that they're in control of how a story is told, that their messaging really speaks to them so that they're memorable. So that kind of flipped the switch. I didn't know how to do it yet, but I had that realization of, If I want to be successful on camera in the media space, it's a whole different ball of wax than what I learned in school or even in speech and debate. Yeah, I I love that point. I mean, I think that's probably true about a lot of the things like we study and we learn to get good at the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Like even for me, I have a marketing background, but as I think about sales, it's like a totally different script to flip. It's so strange, but I think I love, I love that it's a thing. Like I think it's interesting. (laughs) Um, Okay, but now I have to ask you because you brought it up. Is there an embarrassing story you have to share that you didn't have a learning experience from? Because I, I don't know. I just feel like yeah. I got to I got to pull. There, there, there might there might be one. I'm not even concealing. I'm trying to think of one because I'm I'm very transparent with people. I like to to share my stumbling blocks to let people know. Hey, we're all human. We got to start somewhere. I did have a time on air that my story did not make the editor didn't get it to the the software in time for it to air. And they went to cue my story to play. I'd done the little introduction and I was just, I I literally could not speak. I was frozen. I knew the story inside. Like live, live streaming. Live on TV. Yeah. Just kind of, I, I don't know if it was a physiological reaction, but I stood there (laughs) not speaking and they're supposed to in the control room, hit the button to like, you know, cut to a different, camera angle or go to something else, but they didn't do that. So there was just this moment of me introducing it, tossing to the story to be played and just, 
Yes. I mean, we're just going to let her sit this one out. See, yeah, there, was a little, there was a little talk <laughs> with management. <laughs> well, the management talking to me after. And to this day, I don't even, it's the antithesis of, of who I am. Because learning to, to riff on the fly and ad lib is, is what yeah, I was just dying your moment. I don't know I what it. happened. I, I I literally had just total sudden brain death. And uh, well, it was embarrassing, happened. but life went on. Right. And, and that's what I to the best of us. Yeah. And, and uh, kind of as a, a teachable moment, I would say from that for people watching and listening is if you have even these big mistakes, if you are speaking from a place of passion and being in, of service, your audience will forgive you. So we, I feel like yes. we often get hung up on the, I froze or I waited too long. I put too many ums or ahs in there. When you really know, know your content and you, and even acknowledging in the room, you know what I, uh, at the, it lost, I lost my train of thought here and what I wanted to talk about. But like I mentioned earlier and just, just addressing the elephant in the room, yeah. don't be afraid to do that. People are so afraid of it not being perfect and they set the bar up here and then it becomes this, this death spiral of anxiety. Just, just own it. You know? Yeah. That's something I learned yeah. from there. I love that. I love that. Um, Christy, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're working on now or anything that's coming up that you're super excited about. Yeah. Lots in the pipeline, which it's, it's been a, a great start to 2023 with the exception of, as I, as I shared with you offline, some travel delays and lost luggage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm getting the opportunity to train more and more companies, more and more individuals. And as you know, as an entrepreneur, your bandwidth is limited. So what I'm yep. working on right now is developing an online program for that people can do that's self-paced, that'll give them a chance to uh, take the knowledge that I'm sharing with people in real time, but then do it when it's convenient for them. And that's been part of the excitement as well for me in growing my business is not just training locally, not just training nationally, but training globally. And I've really been enjoying recently doing trainings with quite a few people that are in Southeast Asia and learning about a whole different communication style, learning about huge cultural differences and adjusting my training and how I work with people to reflect what's going to be successful for them in their space. Because we are the loud Americans. What flies with us <laughs> and what resonates with us and what's culturally acceptable is much different than in other parts of yeah. the world. So that will be yeah. part of what I continue to to grow and develop as well. I'm going to be doing a lot more keynote speaking and event emceeing, including around the Super Bowl. Stay tuned because that's coming to Phoenix this Ooh. January. Yes. And I've had the chance to also join a, a couple of boards, which is is exciting for me because when I lived yeah. in the world of news, you have weird hours. You can never consistently be a part of any group that meets, you sure. know, Tuesday at seven o'clock because you're on air or if you're on the morning show, yeah. you're asleep getting ready for the next day. Um, and I'm also in the process of training my little Norwich Terrier to become an animal assisted therapy dog. So I know that's not professional on the pipeline, but that's something that's I'm, I'm proud of and excited of because that's my past life. The nonprofits I worked for were in the animal space. And I, oh. I don't know if you knew this, I grew up training service animals, guide dogs for the blind, wilderness search and rescue wow. animals. So that's kind of coming full, full circle. And that's been part of the, the joy of this business is getting to connect with companies and people that have to do with my, my passions. Well, I love that because, you know, we often, we talk about how, you know, you can use all of yourself to build the life that you want for yes. yourself. And so I love that you have taken your quote unquote professional skill sets and you're, you're building your business here, but you're like, Hey, I still have this thing that I love over here and I can do yes. something with that. That's awesome. Very Thank cool. You. Thank you. Um, well, I'm very excited for your course to come out and definitely Thank make you. sure to share Me that too. with us when it's ready. Yes. Um, my last question for you, Christy, is what is your greatest insight or discovery about life and entrepreneurship? Mm, big life questions today, Kylie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you know, just on this one. Come, coming at you big time. <laughs> I love it. Please, please. I coach and I teach for a living. That, that's what I do, whether it's in a workshop, a training program, one on one private coaching. But the education that I've gotten from my clients and from the organizations I've worked with, the people I've worked with has been 
incredibly fulfilling, more so than I could have imagined. I feel like that creative part of me, the little girl who did sew and paint and did needlework and was sang in musical theater and was in an acapella group, a lot of that went dormant for a long time as I found myself shriveling up in my my day-to-day job. And so entrepreneurism, while it may may sound like a funny outcome, but it has allowed me to step into my creativity and into the best version of myself, not just create, not just creatively, but also professionally and personally, because I'm getting to, to your point, build the life that I love. So being an entrepreneur has allowed me to rediscover those passions, reconnect with people in the community who I find inspiring, get to be a part of cool and interesting uh, organizations. And that has been just really transformative. I, I feel like in the person I was even a year ago, certainly five or 10 years ago, is completely different than the person I've become living the entrepreneurial lifestyle. And I'm very, very grateful for it. I love that. Love that. Um, And we are so lucky that you are who you are and bringing all of your skills to all of us. So thank you for that. Thank you. And likewise, Um, for what you're doing, Kylie, a huge service to bring people who are expert in all their spaces to support each other. So round of applause to you. Keep up what you're doing. Wow. Thank you very much, my dear. Um, Christy, if anybody else is out there sitting around and saying, okay, I'm in, tell me more about Christy and how can I get in touch with her? How can they get in touch with you? You can find me pretty much anywhere. I'm not on TikTok yet. I've been told again, (laughs) again, you gotta get on TikTok. But if you just look up my name, which I'm sure will be in the show notes since the spelling is is tough, but it's Christy Siefkin, S-I-E-F-K-I-N. If you just Google my name, you will find, uh, that's my web address for my website. I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on YouTube. And speaking of video, I love to share little tips and tricks with people on all of those platforms. So even if you don't end up being uh, working with me directly, I love to share knowledge with people and help them become the most confident version of themselves when they communicate. So you can follow me on those platforms. Certainly, if you're looking for customized guidance, if your team needs guidance, that's what gets me up with energy in the morning. So I'd love to talk to you. I love it. All right. Well, for anybody listening, if you have enjoyed today's conversation with Christy as much as I have, please go ahead and leave a review wherever you are listening. And Christy, thank you again. Thank you, Kylie. Have a good one. To continue learning how to better build your business and make your vision a reality, subscribe to the Welcome to Eloma email list at welcometoeloma.com. 